If you've gotten used to the rigors of social distancing, election day might seem either a distant memory or a scary prospect. But 2020 is an important election year and officials and activists are concerned about what's in store for voter participation. Among them are some Boston city councilors who've also been looking at more immediate challenges in the community. We'd like to welcome the district councilor from West Roxbury and Jamaica Plain, Matt O'Malley. Uh, thank you very much for being with us, councilor. Great to be with you as always, Chris. Councilor, speaking of immediate uh, challenges, uh, I guess that's a big deal for people who are older. You've been concerned with that in your district. What have you been doing? Well, as it relates to our response to the coronavirus, you know, we've been really focused on uh, making sure that everyone has access to information, making sure that we can check in with people. Probably the first week, so I'm thinking around St. Patrick's Day week, around the 17th or 18th of March, uh, I put out a call on social media saying that I was going to start calling through some of the senior citizens in District 6, uh, of whom there are many. We, uh, West Rockby particularly has the highest percentage of residents over the age of 60 of any neighborhood in Boston. And just asked for volunteers. We began with my staff and me and um, thousands and thousands and thousands of names. Uh, and I was incredibly gratified that within days of sending out a tweet and a Facebook post, we had close to 50 and then 75 and over 100. And, and by now it's been over 200 volunteers uh, from both within and outside of District 6 who've reached out and said, we wanna help. Uh, how, can we, how can we check in on our neighbors? And that's really been the purpose of these calls. We've now completed about 8,000 calls. Uh, some, some people we follow up with several times. Uh, the purpose is really just to check in a wellness call, make sure that uh, residents uh, have access to all the information. We've had to do some grocery runs or some uh, pharmacy runs, which, which my team and I are absolutely happy to do. We're honored to do to be able to help out in some small way. But I, I've been really heartened how we've seen community really strengthen during this un, unimaginably difficult uh, time that we're all facing. Of course, uh, your district in Jamaica Plain, West Roxbury, has a, a lot of great independent restaurants or other kinds of yes. food businesses. We're all really hurting right now. And I guess uh, you're concerned about um, helping people make uh, some kind of purchases from them, but you also don't want too much to the, the gains from that to be taken by a third party. That's right. So another thing we've been doing, and we've, uh, my team has been able to compile a list of all of our great restaurants. Obviously it's changing. Some restaurants uh, have been opened up during the entire pandemic. Others were closed for a period or have reopened or, or had to close after uh, some difficulty. So one thing that we did is we uh, created an online database, an interactive map that has all the restaurants listed in West Roxbury, Rosenville, Jamaica Plain, uh, Mission Hill and Roxbury that, that are part of District 6. Um, and on top of that, and just reaching out to some of the restaurateurs in my district, I asked how we could be helpful. And an issue that kept coming up was the fact that while there's great appreciation for ma many restaurateurs that we've been very nimble as a city and as a state uh, to A, allow for expedited uh, delivery services or allow for the sale of beer and wine uh, as part of a delivery service, which you know a, a month ago would have been unimaginable in a city like Boston. Uh, but one issue that kept really standing out is the notion that we've got these third party uh, delivery services. Uh, there, there are four major ones for the country, four firms that account for about 99% of all third party delivery. And they can, uh, they often ch charge a premium rate. It's anywhere between 20 and 30% on average. Now, a restaurant during non pandemic times that doesn't have an in house delivery staff. Um, I'm not, you know, typically a pizza parlor or a Chinese food restaurant would have in-house delivery staff whom they would pay hopefully well and hopefully be tipped well. Uh, but if you're more of a traditional sit down restaurant, a larger restaurant, a more front of house focused restaurant, you typically would only derive about three to 5% of your business on delivery. So you would happily pay that extra fee to be able to get your product to a customer. Well, given the fact that there are no more opportunities for sit down restaurants, at least in the time being, Restaurants that would typically account for two, three, maybe even 5% of their businesses delivery are now looking at 80 to 85% of their businesses delivery and the rest being pickup. So when you're paying that premium 30 to 20 to 30% uh, rate, your profit margin is non-existent. You're, you're actually losing money. And given the fact that uh, folks in the restaurant industry expect perhaps as high as 40% of all restaurants to uh, have difficulty reopening in a post-COVID-19 world. We need to do everything we can to help support these restaurants now. 
Now, many, many other cities across the country, from LA to Chicago to San Francisco to Cambridge, right across the river, have capped the rate for these third-party delivery systems to anywhere from 10 to 15%. It's about half of what they're charging now. Given the sheer volume of business, it allows these third-party vendors to still be profitable while protecting our small businesses and protect, particularly our small restaurants. So that's one thing that I've been focused on. I introduced a hearing order with Councilors Flaherty and Flynn earlier this week, and I'm looking forward to uh, hopeful action soon. And I, and I guess uh, one of the reasons you have to look into this very seriously is that for all the proliferation of these independent companies in the neighborhoods, there aren't that many co co companies that do the delivery. That's right. There's four that account for about 99% uh, of all deliveries across the country. I mean, that, that, that's, it, it's not quite a monopoly, but it's uh, pretty darn close to it. And it can allow, you know, I, I reached out to several of the companies and, and some have reached out to me and they're, they often tell me that their uh, fee and their, their, their costs are proprietary information. That's fine. We, we've been able to deduce that it's about uh, 20 to 30%. But when you have so few companies, uh, it doesn't allow for the same uh, uh, competition, which is always good for the vendor and consumer. Other cities have capped these fees, or at least they've tried to? That's right. Uh, it's typically between 10 and 15 percent, which again is about half of what the current rate is. Some have suggested a, a, a cap as low as 5 percent, which again, I think the lower the better. The sheer volume of business will allow these companies to continue to make a windfall um, while at the same time not penalizing our small businesses who either have to absorb the cost or pass that cost on to the consumer. Um, this would be a temporary measure, and I think that's important to note, but given the fact that we are in uncharted waters right now, and given the fact that the, the ramification and the impact on our economy is going to be unlike anything we've ever experienced, it is important now that these vendors are able to work in good faith with their clients and with our local businesses to be able to allow both to survive. Well, it, it's hard to imagine restaurants would sit down business at full capacity yeah. anytime soon. And the same thing goes for polling places. You're yeah. trying to do something about that. I sure am, Chris. You know, we had the state primary in Massachusetts, the presidential preference primary in early March. Um, I remember voting there, obviously. It was only a couple of months ago, though it seems like it was a couple of years ago. And then I think it was three weeks after our presidential primary, uh, the state of uh, Wisconsin had their primary uh, in the midst of pandemic, despite the fact that the governor of that state, Tony Evers, sought to move the date, uh, he was unable to do so. And the images out of Wisconsin were positively haunting. You had people lined up to vote. You had a, a cities in Wisconsin which were operating at a fraction of a percent of their ca normal capability because it was so difficult to get people to work the polls, um, which then meant longer lines, and it really was putting members of the public at risk. We have two elections coming up this fall. We have our state primary on September 1st, and then of course we have our election day in November. November 3rd, I believe, is the date. Now I am hopeful that we will have some return to normalcy by then, but there's no guarantee of that. There's also no guarantee that we won't see the virus come back as sort of the next iteration of the flu season, typical flu season ramps up, which would be around November or October. So we need to be nimble and we need to be aggressive. And we need to do what at least three other states have done statewide, states with similar populations to the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, and that's allow for vote by mail. Every year, uh, the Secretary of State, sent every, every election year, so biannually, at either a state or a governor's election, whenever there are referendum questions, the uh, Secretary of the Commonwealth sends a, a voter packet to every registered voter. That's great. That's important. And I appreciate his transparency and his voter education. But it shows that where there is a will, there's certainly a way. And if we're serious about protecting our voters and protecting the important, and I would argue that this election in November is the most important election any of us will ever or have ever lived through, uh, we need to make sure that we have opportunities for people to vote and we have opportunities for people to vote safely. A vote by mail election will do precisely that. We need to start planning now. This isn't the city's decision, and I wanna be clear about that. The city of Boston can't operate independently of the Commonwealth. All of our elections are run by the state through, you know, and they, there's obviously opportunities for cities and towns to, uh, to participate in, in the process, but this has to be done statewide. We need to begin the process now. 
We've called for a hearing. All of my colleagues signed on as co-sponsors. It's going to be uh, within the first, or excuse me, the second week of May, uh, we'll have a hearing. And I'm hopeful that if not by September 1st, certainly by November, we'll be able to do an all vote by mail election in the Congress.